Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be talking about finding the place that's right for your tiny home, finding a sense of community, finding a parking place, that sort of thing. So my guest today is Jill Kanto. She is the founder of SearchTinyHouseVillages.com. This is a really great resource if you're looking for a place to park your house, uh, <laughs> which always cracks me up because it sounds funny to say park your house. Uh, but welcome, Jill. Great to have you with us today. So, Jill, tell me about how you downsized in the midst of building a tiny house and taking care of kids and all of that and working, right? How did yeah, you, I was holding down a job as well. How do you do that? How does that even work? <laughs> well, I'm not organized. I'm, I've never been an organized type of person. Every year in high school, I remember... Um, at the start of the school year, I'd, I would think this is going to be my year that I'm going to have an organized trapper keeper and I'm going to be on top of everything <laughs> and it's all going to look good. Yeah. Um, and it never happened. By the right. second week, it was oh, my book bag was already this hopeless mess of just papers falling out everywhere. I'm not that person. I am like a project hound. I love to take on more and more until I can't, until like I'm just completely um, at, um, at capacity. Um, so I would love to have tell you that I spent the entire build, pro the 13 month build time, um, you know, carefully organizing, um, having a process as I was going along. None of that happened. I, um, I had, I didn't have a, um, a place to live in it yet. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, um, and I had already given notice to my landlord that I'd be moving out at the end of the month, both stellar decisions at the time. <laughs> um, and I hadn't begun downsizing at all. So I did a mad dash of just piles, um, of like, definitely don't need it. I might want this, this is maybe pile. And this is like, gotta have it pile. And then, um, everything from pretty much the, from the maybe and, um, and um, don't want it pile um, went away. And then um, the got to have it pile also got smaller too. I realized I didn't need nearly as much as I thought out of that. Um, <clears throat> and <laughs> I wish that I had done some things like um, that I hear now that I've heard now that going to all these tiny house festivals, I've heard such great information from everybody, such as, um, you know, flipping around your clothes and on all on one side on the clothes hangers and then you know after you wear a certain item hang it up with a clothes hanger facing the opposite direction and then, then you get a good idea of what clothes you're actually wearing yeah um yeah I didn't do any of that um and, <laughs> and um it's a and, great and, tip but you know <laughs> yeah, if you do it yeah. <laughs> you yeah, right. um or like a touch diary um to, yeah. to decide what items I'm actually touching throughout the day and throughout the seasons um and on the other side of that, when I was building my tiny house, I wish that I had taken those things into consideration when I was building the storage for the tiny house. So I have a big closet. I've got really nice cubes under my stairs and under my bed is all storage. But it, not, it doesn't necessarily fit the items that I have that need to be stored um, or that need you know these specific spots. So I wish that I had done that and that would have made it a little bit easier. But I got here all, all as well. Um, and out of the entire, um, I, get, I have a pretty um, uh, terrible, a pretty bad me memory. But the only thing that I've ever wished that I had kept was a salad spinner, and that's easily re yeah. fixable. Um, right. So. I looked, I had a colander and a salad spinner. I was like, oh, this seems like, this seems like these are kind of um, usable and, and different, situ like for the same thing, um, which I, again, I kept the colander. If I had kept the salad spinner, I would have been fine, but I went right. with the colander instead. Right. So I had to replace the salad spinner, but that's been over a three year process um, of things that, I, you know, so I think that's a pretty good score, especially for the dash. <laughs> um, and, and I honestly feel like I could go with way less than I have now. And that's a common thread that I hear from people living yes. tiny. Well, they will, they will look around their house and be like, I could do less. I could go smaller. Um, and as I was going tiny, at first it was, it, you know, it's a little overwhelming. It's very daunting. There's nostalgia involved with it. There's emotions connected to these things. And so that was initially hard, but I got into the kind of this feeding frenzy of, of just getting rid of everything because the more I got rid of the lighter I felt. Yes. And I read that the average household has over 300,000 things in it. And wow. my job in my household was manager of 300,000 things. And I don't want that job. Oh, me <laughs> so, so I fired myself and got rid of as much as I could. And you know, it's so much easier. I can clean my house. I can do a quick clean in like five minutes and which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and a deep clean in a couple of hours. Um, yeah. that's, that's as a single mom who had right. to pr uh, really prioritize her time, who was either clean or sleep. Like those are my two options. <laughs> you know, now I living tiny, 
regardless just gives you so much extra free time. It's crazy. Um, because, uh, if you choose, because you can scale down all of your costs and which means you can scale down your um, work hours too. Mm -hmm. Um, so that really has a huge impact just, just that alone. Um, but yeah, now, now I can clean my house in just a short period of time. I don't want to spend my life cleaning. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Um, I've, I've done my laundry in the bathtub at times. I've tried okay. that out. Um, and that's, How did it that's, go? Actually, that's actually really cool. I felt like I was like, you know, um, living on the prairie a little bit. Uh, I had one of those plungers with the holes in it. Yep. It took forever. Um, yeah. but if I, if I did it like that, I would save, cause I go to a laundromat, I would save about $700 a year. So oh, wow. it's an option. I do have one of those like little portable, um, washer and like spin dryers. And mm -hmm. I use those actually quite often. If okay. I, if I do that every couple of days, I'm um, just like, uh, you know, um, two days worth of clothes each time. Um, it's, it only takes a short period of time and it saves me quite a bit. Um, well, there you go. Yeah. So I do enjoy that. But yeah, I think I upgraded my bathroom. I don't think that there's any loss there at all. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about going, um, about simplifying your life in community. Um, that seems like a really interesting component given your work with um, searchtinyhousevillages.com. Uh, what does that community aspect bring into living in a kind of countercultural way? Yeah, so you might have um, some inter interesting information given your background to, con to contribute to this. Um, but I think in our life, in our modern lifestyles, we have a lot of, we do a lot of redundant work. We're side by side neighbors and we're all kind of doing the same repetitive tasks. Yep. Um, and so a lot of that can um, be eliminated if you're willing to share some of your life with other people. Yeah. So I'm in, um, you know, a very small community. There's two households here. It's a community. It's just very small. We actually have another family moving in very soon. I'm very excited about that. Yay. But so there's benefits about the way that I'm living um, mm -hmm. uh, in this very small community right now. I grow food. That's my happy place. I love growing food. Um, and it's my like free therapy. Um, and so I grow food. They get free food. They have chickens, um, so, um, oh, so I get free eggs, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and I used to, uh, my, I used to have a foster horse. I don't any longer, but um, I used to have the horse, and we would share care for the horses, which is great because horses have you know require a lot of um, effort. Yeah. Um. So that really minimized um, that workload. Now, when this new family moves in, um, the woman loves to cook. She feels like it's her mission in life to feed everybody. Oh, hallelujah. And so that is a jewelry <laughs> for her. Yeah. And for me, it's always a struggle. Yeah. Um, it's something that's important to me, but it's always a struggle. So she is going to um, do something that's very easy for her and include me in her, um, in, in her cooking. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, how can I, you know, how can I provide the same service for you? And she needs a website. It's something that I can do in my sleep. It's something oh, that's easy for me. It doesn't cause yeah. suffering. And so we have a, a trade-off there. I will build her a small website and maintain it, and she will feed me all the time. Um, so that saves me, me and her both time and effort and money. Yeah. Um, now that's and, – and we when we both have kids, so kids sharing in a community is fantastic. Oh, cool. As a single mom, I can't tell you how much work it is to raise children. Uh, it's hard enough to do it in, by, um, in, a, in, you know, in a nuclear family, much right. less doing it by yourself. But honestly, right. doing it in a nuclear family is, is too hard too. Mm -hmm. Like as a species, we've come along in a setting where we have multiple adults and multiple um, age range of kids all pitching in and, and doing the work together. Mm -hmm. um, and the kids are so much more uh, well-rounded because they have so many more minds to download information and models to pull from. And um, so, so that's going to be really interesting too when, um, when we have more people here to kid share with. It's already fantastic to kid share with the one family, but I'm really excited um, to expand that because the new family moving in, they have four kids. Um, so that'll be really, um, really interesting. Um, now you can scale up that model. There's actually a community not very far from you. You're in Virginia um, and they're called Twin Oaks and they're on 450 acres. Oh, and wow. they have 50 adults and um, 15 kids last I checked. And, um, so they only work 42 hours a week and then the, the rest of their time is theirs. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So, um, so like their level of commitment and sharing to one another are, is greater than what I'm experiencing in my community, but they get more benefits out of it. Um, so somebody there is doing all their cooking, all their cleaning, all their grocery shopping, all their personal shopping, building their houses, like all that's being taken care of, um, because of their level of sharing, um, mm -hmm. which is something that I would, um, I would actually absolutely love to do in the future. Um, I, I do love the situation right now, but ultimately I would love to have more of a level of sharing so that there's even more benefits that come from it. Wow. 
Um, wow, yeah. this is, you're opening my eyes to something that I think is really exciting. I mean, yeah, and what's really interesting is at Twin Oaks, they, um, their cost per living per person per year is only like $7,000. It's wow. ridiculous. Now they're not in individual tiny houses, so it's a little bit different. They have co-housing, um, like more like uh, several dorms set up. You know, okay. they have they probably have like ten different buildings. You know, seven seven of them are living um, housing or for for living in, and then the other ones are um, no, there's more than ten. And the other and they have other ones that are for like large commercial kitchens and dance halls and play areas, and um, and they have a tofu factory for um, for their income and a hammock making factory for income and like a farm for income. So. Um, and, and visitor um, quarters as well. So um, it's, it's a really cool setup. I can see that being really beneficial. I'm, um, we no longer live in a tiny house. We're here in a little neighborhood. Our house is 660 square feet, and most of the houses in this neighborhood are about that size. And yet every single one of us has the lawnmower and the weed eater. <laughs> and just the waste and redundancy of that when it, there could be one, and maybe that's one person's job to go around and mow all the yards and somebody else is doing snow removal. Or, I mean, there's a million ways that could work, and I could really get behind somebody else mowing my yard. <laughs> Absolutely. I hear you. All the things that cause you suffering, somebody else yes. likes to do. That yes. actually brings up a really interesting point because at Twin Oaks, it's an all volunteer economy. Yeah. So you're picking the jobs that you like. Oh, cool. And, you know, so like for, for my, my, the girl that there's the woman moving in, cooking is her passion, it's her joy. So it's not, it doesn't feel like work for her. Um, and so there, somebody absolutely loves to be outside mowing the lawn. And there's people that love to scrub toilets, believe it or not. People volunteer for that job at Twin Oaks. Yeah. The only thing that people don't volunteer for, ironically, which I would have no problem doing, I don't know why this is always an issue, is dishwashing. So um, every two weeks or so, you'll get an hour um, dishwashing session as part of your 42 hours. Um, yeah, and, and to bring up the, to talk about the other point that you brought up, everybody having a lawnmower, yeah. they, they have, um, one of the ways that they're able to keep the cost down so much is they have a series of libraries. So we're accustomed to going to a book library and checking out yep. a book. Yep. They have a series, uh, like tool libraries, bike libraries, car libraries, and even like music instrument libraries, and even a clothes library. So yep. like they have one building that um, the whole top floor is just clothes. So you can have your own private clothes and um, do your own laundry if you'd like, but you can also go to the, what's um, the communal closet and you could ne go never wearing the same outfit twice if you wanted to. Um, wow. Like, almost your entire life. Um, so uh, it's, it's just a completely different way to look at, the, um, at everything, you know? Yeah. Wow, that's exciting. I, I love kind of that whole thing about tiny house living that it attracts people who live outside the, the boxes of life. And yeah. that's definitely outside a box of life. And I love it. I just really love even hearing about it. Yeah, it's outside of the box of life now. But if you look like through like evolutionary, yeah. evolutionarily, it's, it's, we're, we're living quite outside the box now. We're on this... Right. Um, like, especially in the West, we have a much more individualistic society. Um, there are places, um, it's still in modern um, times that are a more cooperative society. Mm -hmm. um, but we are very much, we're on a very much individualistic streak. Um, independence, that's like the theme that we have um, in the U.S. Um, and I was going to go somewhere with that because there's something that I really wanted to bring up um, that tied into that. Well, the, I think what you lose is, I mean... I think so many of us have a sense of isolation that's actually coming from our house, a sense of being disconnected from other people that actually is because our houses are too big and we don't get to live with a grandmother. We don't get to live with all those other perspectives uh, close by and close knit. So uh, like you said, so many places in the world, that family unit, that family unit stays together, that whole um, community of immediate family stays together in one place. But when every member of the family has a building of their own, then automatically it's built in this kind of um, isolation and that can lead to depression. So it's interesting that we've gone this way. But it's not really on our favor, you know? Yeah, I agree. There's, um, there's actually some happy index studies being done on Twin Oaks. Um, so at Twin Oaks, you know, you might not be related to the people that are there, but so they're kind of somewhere between, um, you know, immediate family and extended family. Um, they fall somewhere on that range. And um, they, they, I, I think like an, a way to term what you were talking about is like we've really just like diluted our village. Yeah. Um, so now like instead of having a uh, really having a lot of community glue with the people that are most important to our lives, they can be in, on the other side of the world or the country yeah. or across town or something. And then so it has a compounding um, effect when we have 
we, when we have like so many loose ties or like stretched ties um, on our happiness, absolutely. And even just being in my house, um, sometimes I feel isolated. Um, now, now when I before I lived here, um, but now like I can go outside and I and that's something that should be brought up about Twin Oaks. Everybody in Twin Oaks, whether you are um, and a couple or not, if you're married or not, everybody gets their own room there because it's their, their place of refuge, their sense of privacy. Cause that can be something that might feel, feel a little bit lost in a communal setting. Um, but, um, but they always have these places where people can be together too. Um, so here and now that I'm in a community, I actually have a sign on my door that says like visitors welcome. And I can flip it over on the other side that says um, recharging, please come back later. Oh, and so, we, we, yeah, we all have that on here. And so yeah. when I'm feeling lonely, I just flip that sign and there's going to be a kid at my door in like three seconds, <laughs> um, and, you know, that I can talk to and play. Off. I love playing with kids. It's really fun. Um, um, and we also have all the common areas that we can go out or I can go over to their house or anything. And so that sense of like loneliness is, is really gone. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So uh, how do we recreate that without necessarily everybody buying a little tiny houses and move in? Is there, are there ways that people in quote unquote normal houses can achieve more community? Yeah. I mean, there's the, like, I, I typically ask people what the difference, um, what, what, like what their exposure is to um, neighbor, like to communities before. Most of us are more um, familiar with neighborhoods um, and maybe some sense of community. Um, Some of us that grew up in a more urban setting might be, have more of a sense of community than the, I grew up in suburbia and it just felt more like neighborhood to me. Um, So I I definitely think that there's things that we can do. Um, One of the things is simply um, sharing our, our items. So if we have like, you don't even need a centralized location for this, but you could have an agreement with your neighbors to say like, Oh, you know, I'll have the lawnmower. Can I, can I borrow your car? Can we kid share? Like, and just decide what things it is that, that, um, that are immediately accessible to you. Mm -hmm. Another thing that parents could do uh, is have like a child care daycare ring, you know, where one day a week each child, uh, each parent is watching the children. Oh, and then not only does that save them money because they don't have to pay for daycare, but it's creating community glue. Mm-hmm. Creating community glue is like one of the most important things because it, it, it makes it makes you invested in the other people involved. And once you're invested in them, then you're starting to actually build community because you care what happens to them. Yeah. Um, so, and another thing that's really fantastic um, is simply just creating um, events to have together. Um, so it can be just as simple as let's have um, a, a weekly pot, potluck or something um, so okay. that you're creating events together. You can grow that food together too, and that's going to bring it together more. So, you know, it's, if you don't have the, like the, uh, the structural framework um, in place for an ideal setting, you can still absolutely recreate that um, on, a, on a lesser level. Mm-hmm. In the community I'm from, the the Mennonite community, a lot of those um, at one time were very location centric. And so there were a lot of families in one place and they could um, share and and, um, do projects together. I remember as a kid that my grandmother and my aunts and my mom and I would get together and put up peaches and we would do green beans and all of those things that it took a it took all the women to get together and do those things so that each of us went home with our peaches and our green beans. And um, now that's not something we can do because we live too far apart. But, and you know, that, that whole generation has changed and now we get them at sharp shopper or you know <laughs> we it, it's a little hard to compete with super cheap frozen green beans you know so some of those ways have um have kind of gone to the side but i i get how that's um powerfully connecting people together in a way that's so much fun and yeah that's the thing it doesn't feel like work job. yeah really big job a hot sweaty you know canning is just really plain work yeah Um, it can be so much faster and so much more fun when it's a community activity absolutely um i saw a really great um documentary called leaving i think it's leaving ladakh or learning from ladakh i can't remember it was this i believe it was in india and there was um uh, like an actual village and they were um they were agricultural and they were um raising animals and and each time, that each family, when they needed to um, do their harvest, all of the people from the community would come in and help them harvest. Right. All of them would come in and help them build their houses. You know, it was very communal, very um, interdependent. The interdependence level was very high. Um, and then they introduced a road to this um, remote mountain area, um, to connecting it to the rest of like mainstream India. And then the concept of work came in because they didn't know that this was work doing that. Oh. Um, you know, because they're just harvesting, they're singing as they're doing it, they're enjoying each other's company. I'm sure it's, it's you know, it's, it's, um, 
it's laborious, but they didn't consider it work. You know, this was just life. Um, and um, so, and, and the um, concept of poverty came in, and oh, lesser, wow. and 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 um, greed, and um, jealousy, and oh, all of those yeah. concepts were introduced in a place that was, you know, I'm sure they had their issues, but fairly idyllic. But oh, it's a really great documentary, um, wow. and it's it really it just shows a very sharp contrast how you can go from more of um, from a cooperative um, society to, um, an individualistic society almost overnight. Wow. That's sobering, isn't it? And we tend to value our individuality so much, but I wonder what we're losing. I mean, I think you're giving really great examples of what we're losing. Yeah. For anybody that's listening, that would be interested, um, at Twin Oaks every year, this is very close to you, actually. Um, there's a communities conference. Um, it's every Labor Day weekend. So it's coming up very soon um, at the time of this recording. Um, and it's a weekend of workshops where you learn the skill set to start or live in a community. Um, yeah. And, um, there's something else that's really great about it as well, though. At the beginning of the conference, they have, um, people that are already living in community stand up. So one person from each community or forming community, they'll stand up and they'll get 60 seconds to give an elevator pitch about what their community is like. Mm -hmm. If they're accepting members, the themes, um, where it's located and then they'll make themselves available for two hours after that. So you can pretty much speed date all these communities to see if any of them are a good fit for you to either join, um, um, check out or try to recreate. Um, the other thing that's amazing about it is that you are a temporary intention, intentional community while you're there. Um, cause everybody has a two hour shift, um, during that weekend, um, where you, you're doing something, you're either helping cook or you're helping with the kids that are there. You're, um, helping the workshops, you know, so everybody is, you are all working together and you're making this whole conference, um, flow. Wow. So it's a really, um, great way to just kind of throw yourself in and see what that feels like. And I know that like I'm, I have a hard time sitting still. That's just my personality. It's inherited from my mom. Um, So I avoid stillness. But when I'm there, I just feel so fulfilled with just sitting. Wow. Um, Because it, I, being in that type of setting where it's an intense type, a more intense type of communal setting and working together, um, I just feel everything kind of slowed down Mm -hmm. and, um, and don't have a need for distractions. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And I honestly will not remember where my phone is or anything. So it's, it's a really, Perfect. Um, it's a really fantastic situation. Yeah. Um, so I do recommend if anybody's interested on that, you can go to communitiesconference.org and I go, I've been going for the past like seven years. I go every year. I find it very valuable and it's only a hundred dollars. They're not trying to make money off of it at all. And that includes food. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. No, I, I like the idea that it's not just telling, it's showing, and you're actually having a very experiential um, time um, learning, because we learn in all different kinds of ways. Some people learn by hearing, some people learn by watching, and many of us learn hands-on, and so that's providing a very, um, I don't know how you would say, multi-learner uh, kind of approach to the topic, which is fantastic. So that's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's been going on for like, well, Twin Oaks has been around for 50 years. I'm not sure how long the community's conference has been, but I think it's at least 30 years. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they really tweaked it to make it work really well. They've had their, their, you know, a lot of time to work it out. Mm-hmm. Well, tell me what has changed in your life now that you live in a tiny house and that, uh, some of those, uh, requirements on you as in terms of making enough money to fund the big, I don't know, propane bill or electric bill or whatever. What's changed in your life, nuts and bolts wise, now that you live tiny? How long do we have? Yes, we've got all the time. Ah, Because everything, everything is different. Uh, I get sleep now. I got nine hours of sleep last night. Um, That's probably the biggest change in my life. Um, But to to go for nuts and bolts. um, Okay. So I used to have to work six or seven days a week to make six six or seven days a week to make ends Mm -hmm. meet. Now to make ends meet, I only have to work one day a week. Wow. Cool. I work more than that. Right. But that's all I have to to do to make ends meet, um, which is phenomenal. I I kind of laugh when you say the big propane bill, because um, we have, we use propane for our, um, our water heater, our instant water heater. And I changed that propane tank out maybe, and it's just a little barbecue propane tank. It's just really little. I change that out maybe on average once every two months. Yeah. Um, And my electric bill, at the highest was $80. Yeah. Um, and, but that was in the middle of winter and, um, I did, I, I have a mini split, but I haven't installed it yet. So I'm using, um, electric, um, heat, um, heaters and, and it's, uh, it's space not the most efficient. Way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Kind of like space heaters and it's not the most efficient way to heat. So, um, that cranked it up and that's when I got the oven too. That's when my, <laughs> when my costs went up. Yeah. 
Um, and, but like in the summer, my, my bill is like $5 for electricity. Yeah. So it's cool. what I really love about Jill's story is that this idea of living in intentional community with other people, with parking your house on the same property close enough that you can sh- swap some, um, some skills and some share some, uh, some tasks, but far enough away that you can retain your sense of privacy when you need it and being able to recharge your battery alone when you, when that's necessary. And also being able to find, uh, people to do things with and, uh, to interact with in those times when you really do want some connection. Uh, we have a tendency to go to our screens for connection and that's inauthentic. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a poor, Uh, substitute for the real thing. So I think this sense of community, I mean, we have lost living this way over the generations because we valued individuality so much because we valued owning our own space and having it all set up like we wanted it to. What we didn't realize is that was leaving us with a sense of isolation. And so being able to live in a tiny house or live in a situation where you're closer with other people to bring back that sense of connectedness. That I think is a really wonderful component to this life, um, the potential of living tiny in this manner. So please check out uh, Jill Kanto's website, searchtinyhousevillages.com. And the next time that you hear somebody say, I, would, I can't go tiny because I don't have a place to park my house, uh, please point that person to search tinyhousevillages.com because that is a game changer. It is absolutely a game changer because it is possible to find a place to park your house and to uh, live a little closer with people and share some skills and some life experience. And I think that's really a, a, a real blessing to the people who are able to partake in that. So thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. Theme music is composed by William Kirkpatrick. Lyrics by Louisa Stead. Arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at CarmenShank.com.